valued viewers. I hope you're all doing very well. And a very special shout out to my Super Tanks contributor at PhilPots48. And because he did contribute $20 or more, he is elected to do a video and his choice was the Rutland Railroad. And I do apologize to Phil because I'm a little late getting this one out. Um, info was a little bit hard to come by, but I did get it together and here we are. And just a gentle reminder that if you all would like a custom video done, all you have to do is hit the Super Thanks button on any video and contribute $20 or more towards the channel's efforts. And you go to the comments, name your video, and your video takes priority over any project that I am doing at that time. And with that, let's get on with the Rutland Railroad. Enjoy. On December 30th, 1870, longtime rival Vermont Central Railroad leased the Rutland Railroad in an attempt to quell the growing competition from its biggest competitor. Unfortunately, this move eventually forced the Vermont Central into bankruptcy during March of 1896, and the Rutland regained its independence on May 7th of that year. The old adversaries may have ended their longtime feud, but the Rutland continued to grow into the 20th century. On September 27th of 1901, the Rutland Railroad formally took over the Ogdensburg and Lake Champlain Railroad, giving it access to the Ogdensburg along the shores of the St. Lawrence River and connections with Rome, Waterton, and New York at Norwood, and that later became the New York Central Lines. As it turned out, the former O&LC did not provide considerable online freight, aside from interchange traffic, but it would later prove a solid generator of agricultural traffic, most notably milk. And Ogdensburg became a vital port in shipping goods to and from Chicago over the Great Lakes. Just prior to this event was the Rutland Railroad's efforts to provide itself a direction connection with the O&LC. To do so required bridging the gap between Rouse's Point, New York, and Burlington, which meant incorporating a brand new company. And this new company became known as the Rutland and Canadian, completed in 1899. Its right-of-way was an impressive display of engineering. The railroad leapfrogged the northern islands of Lake Champlain and South Hero, Grand Island, and North Hero using a marble rip-wrapped causeway to reach Elber before briefly crossing the waters again to connect with Rouse's Point at the LNLC. The 40 miles of new line were completed in only a year and were consolidated into the Rutland during January of 1901. Amazingly, this wasn't the final addition to the railroad system that year. On June 1st, it also picked up the Chatham and that Lebanon Valley, part of the fabled corkscrew division. The C and LV, along with the Bennington and Rutland, acquired in February of 1900, this road operated between Rutland and Bennington, and that gave the Rutland a through route to Chatham, New York. Both lines comprised the Chatham Division, a windy route complete with 263 curves. While it provided the Rutland with southern interchange to the NYC, it was an operational headache. With these leased lines added to the Rutland system, it had reached its furthest extent, operating just over 400 miles of railroad on a system that looked like a bit like a upside-down L between Chantham, New York, to Elberg, Vermont, with a western extension from Elberg to Ogdensburg, New York. The railroad's one major branch was its original main line, extending from Rutland southeasterly to Bellows Falls, where it connected with the B&M. For all the fondness and status surrounding the Rutland, particularly by the people of Vermont, the railroad continued to struggle for most of its life. The Rutland again fell under the control of an outside railroad when the New York Central gained control of it in 1904, which went on to sell half its interest to the New Haven Railroad in 1911. Such trouble arose in 1915 when the Panama Canal Act forced the Rutland Railroad to divest itself of the Rutland Transit Company, which was a steamship operation that caused its valuable interchange traffic from Chicago over the Great Lakes. The years under the New York Central's control was arguably witnessed one of the last great periods of prosperity for the Rutland Railroad. And some to the good from the Central's control was that the Central moved a large amount of bridge traffic over the Rutland to transfer through Ogdensburg and paid for the infrastructure and equipment upgrades. Alas, these good years will not last for the, la uh, for the Rutland. And following the Panama Canal Act, the Central dropped much of its interest and control in the Rutland Railroad. Between the New York Central and the New Haven Railroad, they owned 52% of the railroad's common stock until 1941, and that's when both sold their interest altogether. During the 1920s, the Rutland Railroad had relatively strong industrial traffic with the rise of lucrative milk shipments and other freight. However, again, these happy times were short-lived. 
and things took a turn for the worst in 1927 when major flooding in Vermont heavily damaged large sections of the Rutlands right away. And then, in May of 1938, the railroad entered receivership and was on the verge of total shutdown until the unions agreed to a wage reduction in August that kept the railroad operating. Additionally, state and local governments, as well as the people of Vermont, worked to keep the company operational by donating money, such as Save the Rutland Club, and reducing its tax burden. Some bills were forgiven altogether. One notable means the road implemented to increase tonnage was the launching of the Whippet, which was a high-speed time freight which ran the length of the system hauling bridge traffic. A 280 consolidation was even painted black and silver to advertise the service, along with print media making potential customers aware of the program. It largely worked, and the company also picked up some less than carload freight in the process, although the train lost its name with the start of World War II. After the war, the Rutland was in trouble again, having already reorganized in November of 1950 to become the Rutland Railway, bringing a new logo and image, the Green Mountain Gateway. This time with a strike as the railroad's organized workers would not comply with a new change in operational practices. The railway fell under new management and that was led by Gardner Caverly uh, after 1954 and he did everything they could to reduce losses and pull the company out of its perennial red ink. Some of these efforts including scrapping the entire steam fleet which was 58 locomotives in all including four new 482s purchased in 1946 for 15 new diesel road switchers from Alco which were RS1s and RS3s in 1951 and 1952. The railway also abandoned the Chatham branch in 1953, which eliminated 57 miles in all, and they also cut the workforce from nearly 1,200 employees to just 400. Purchasing 700 new freight cars from Pullman Standard allow, allowing it to scrap its tired fleet of rolling stock, a lot of which had been accepted by interchange partners. The strike that came down on June 26, 1953 was the first in the company's long history and ultimately led to the cessation of all passenger operations. After 21 days, management and labor were able to reach an agreement and the railroad resumed all operations sans the money losing passenger trains. Unfortunately, all efforts to streamline operations could not curb the growing loss of its freight traffic. The once lucrative milk trains had all but disappeared because they were taken away by semi-trucks, and it was becoming increasingly difficult for management to find ways in keeping the company even marginally profitable. So by the mid-1950s, there were about 331 miles left of the original system, and good management had allowed for one final brief period of relatively good years late during the decade. However, as the 1960s dawned, its ghost returned to doom the company. In 1960, another strike hit the company, and this time, the union would not relent. And the cooling off period was invoked for about a year, but this does not do anything to relieve the stalemate. And for nearly two years after the cooling off period had not brought about an agreement, the property sat dormant as rails rusted over and Mother Nature reclaimed what was rightfully hers. And this time, nothing or no one could save the Rutland Railroad and the Interstate Commerce Commission ruled for total abandonment on January 29th of 1963. Even after this time, the battle continued as unions fought to appeal the ruling and keep the company operational. These efforts ultimately failed, but in an ironic twist of fate, it was announced during mid-June of 1963 that the unions and company had reached an agreement, albeit far too late to save the Rutland. Thankfully, in a proactive move during August of 1963, the state of Vermont purchased the former property from Bennington and Burlington, as well as part of the Bellows Fall Line, creating today's Vermont Railway. The rest of the line, including the entirety of the O and L C, as well as the Burlington Elbrick extension across the lake, was abandoned. Following the shutdown of the Rutland, it was res resurrected just a few years later in 1964. And in that year, Nelson Blount created the Green Mountain Railroad using a forest green and yellow livery inspired directly from the Rutland. And Mr. Blount started this railroad to operate his collection of steam locomotives. Um, Mr. Blount passed away a few years later after creating this new tourist railroad, which eventually became part of the National Park Service's Steamtown USA located in Scranton, Pennsylvania, a highly recommended museum, by the way. The Green Mountain Railroad lived on and split off as its own operation. 
Today, the railroad hauls both passengers and has been widely acclaimed as the top tourist railroad in New England with its spectacular views of Vermont's Green Mountain Range and onboard train services. And with that, I shall wrap up this video. If you enjoyed the video today, please hit the like button. And also, if you've not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button as both features help the channel grow immensely. And don't forget about the super thanks button. If you would like a custom video done such as this one, hit that button. Uh, contribute $20 or more to the uh, channel's efforts and then tell me in the comments what you want done and I do it right away and we thank you very much.